Before I get started, a note about notes. You don't have to take any. I am going to be talking about a lot of different things. Not for very long, but I'm going to be talking about a lot of different things, and I will have a list of all the links at the end. But I would really love it if you tweeted. There is my Twitter handle up the top and the conference hashtag. So if you want to take pictures and tweet about them, that's totally OK. So hi, I'm Katie. Thank you so much for having me at your conference. It is, it's been an amazing weekend. I am very tired, but it has been amazing. Um, one of my many roles in the Python community is as a director of the Python Software Foundation. The PSF is the organization that holds the, international, the intellectual rights behind the Python programming language. We also run PyCon, recently held in Cleveland, and help other regional PyCons around the world with funding and grants. And as a PSF PSA, if you are a voting member of the PSF, please make sure that you've voted for the next round of uh, board directors because uh, you need to vote by tonight. If, you haven't, if you're not a voting member and you don't know what that means, that's fine. If you are, vote. This has been your PSF PSA. In any case, the PSF does things in and around Python. But Python isn't just for developers. A few weeks ago, I put a call out on Twitter asking what exciting projects you've seen in and around the Python space, specifically though not Python itself or its infrastructure. I wanted to know applications that were using Python. And the results I got were biased because I had a lot of people telling me about the wonderful new um, things in the Python standard language, about async IO, about dependency management, and so much more. But this is partially my fault because a lot of people that I follow on Twitter and who follow me are the people that develop all these things. So that's my own fault. However, I wanted to know about all the projects that helped people in their daily lives that happen to use Python. And I got some really good replies that I'll be telling you about today, which brings me to the title of my talk, How Python Can Excel. And spoilers, I meant how Python, the programming language, can become as widespread and as ubiquitous as Microsoft Excel. <laughs> yes, it's a play on words. I am so sorry, but I like plays on words. Python is getting on 30 years old soon, and Python has many great strengths, and it can be used in so many places, but we can still make it easier for users. And Python should be as go-to as Excel is. Now, by Excel, I mean not just Microsoft Excel, insert your preferred spreadsheet application of choice here, but spreadsheets are extremely powerful and flexible. They contain their own domain-specific language where you can programmatically affect your input data. You have a wide variety of visualization properties that you can use. You can create graphs and charts. And heck, I have um, used Excel for so many different things. But Excel itself is a Turing complete language, which means that you can make a computer in Excel. If you don't believe me, people have. This is an example where every time you update the spreadsheet, the clock updates with the current time. I've imported this into Google Spreadsheets, but every time that I make a change just by pasting just to force the sheet to update, it changes the time. And it just keeps on doing this because Excel is so powerful, you can make a computer in Excel. And I use spreadsheets all the time, even though I'm a Pythonista. For example, I have multiple purpose-built applications to help me run PyCon Australia, which happens to be in August in Sydney. Do come along. Our tickets are on sale now. I have so many custom-built applications, and yet I still drop down to a spreadsheet when I need to do some custom complex data analytics. And spreadsheets are much more popular than you, want, than you might think. Recent estimates, recent Estimates suggest that in, as of 2019, there are about 25 million software developers in the world. There are 800 million people that use Microsoft Excel. That's 32 times the amount of people who call themselves software developer professionals that use Microsoft Excel. We are the minority of people that use computers. More people use computers than make the computers happen. 
And that brings me to a delightful axiom that I will be repeating throughout my talk. We are humans, right, working with humans to develop software for the benefit of humans. And that's the crux of the argument I want to make today. We here in the room identify as software developers, be new, intermediate, experienced, or godlike. But Python isn't just for us. Users can be anyone, and users should be everyone. Python should be as accessible, either directly or indirectly, to as many people as possible. That is the way that Python stays around. If it has enough people that care about its existence, it will stick around. And I want to focus on four particular groups of users today. I want to focus on scientists, educators, creators, and explorers. First, the scientists. Not just the scientists in lab coats, but all kinds of scientists. Those that work with a microscope as well as a mini disc. Last year, the Nobel Prize for Economics went to Paul Romer, who found that instead of using proprietary systems like Mathematica, he could more easily share his research with Jupyter Notebooks. To quote the article, open source notebooks are the way forward for sharing research. They provide support integrity while proprietary software encourages secrecy. Jupyter Notebooks have been revolutionary in the data science world, but it's not just Jupyter. These notebooks only get you so far, you need to fill them with something. You get so much power from things like Pandas, NumPy, and Matplotlib. They are such powerful tools for a data scientist. Using these tools, you can get some amazing notebooks. And I want to show you just a few of these implementations that I've found. You can do things as simple as creating graphs to show visualizations of ar arithmetic paradigms, in this case, Euler's method for isolating systems. You know, easy stuff. But as much as you would get an aha moment if you were to manually enter these into your graphics calculator in school, the visual representation here is so much easier to comprehend than just the formula. You can also do more complex graphing, like this representation of color range of tapestry wool that I created as part of my PyCon talk last month in Cleveland. This is a visual representation of the colors of wool available from a particular manufacturer graphed on three axes, red, green, and blue. You can also do some really funky stuff in notebooks, including implementing the hand-drawn stylings of XKCD graphs and being able to generate those programmatically. Noting here that the font has been imported, but the math of the hand-drawn lines and axes is all dynamic. The beauty of these notebooks is that you can pull all the math out and share it around, just like Roma described earlier. I've used this particular notebook with its particular algorithms for my own purposes in my own graphing applications. But you aren't just limited to graphs. You can also do things like generate musical scores right in the notebook, and with enough add-ons, that can play for you. It's literally a notebook in a notebook, I'm sorry. But notebooks give you so much power, but they aren't the holy grail. Data scientists are not Python packaging experts. Economists don't know pips from peps. Trying to work out how to use pip and virtual environment and easy Python and all these things just isn't interesting to them, and it's an active barrier of entry. Trying to tell a new or non-programmer just to pip install something doesn't make sense to them. Having to dive down and explain what pip is and how it works and what virtual env is or pip env or them having to try to find this out for themselves and getting conflicting answers based on historical Stack Overflow records, it's, it's an active barrier. Finding all this deprecated information or things that were historically accurate but are no longer accurate it just ends up with copying and pasting code blindly and causing more confusion. It's this sort of mindset with data scientists that brought around things like Anaconda. Anaconda aims to simplify package management and deployment so a data scientist can just conda install something and it will just work. Anaconda would not have had to be created if Python had a good, usable, understandable installation story. Indeed, just trying to get Python working on Windows has always been hard, and it's only been in the last few months where if you try to enter 
Python into a Windows terminal and you don't have Python installed, the Windows Store pops up for you suggesting that you install Python 3.7. This is the workflow that Windows users get. If you want an application, you install it from the App Store. Python has only just recently appeared in the Windows App Store. You can't just tell someone to get Linux or buy a Mac because the financial and technological barriers here just make it not feasible. So many people use Windows. We need to make Python on Windows easy. This is a barrier that will be introduced soon to Mac users because the next version of Mac OS will not ship Python as standard. They are dropping support for any scripting language, Python, Ruby, and Perl, which means that you can't just run Python without installing it first yourself, which this can be a good thing. Those in the Linux world can attest to how annoying it is to have very old versions of Python sitting around on your Debian servers, but knowing how to install Python is not easy it is an active barrier for new fledgling programmers. We need to understand that humans use Python on many operating systems, and we need to keep this in mind when developing our applications. Something as easy as remembering not to hard code Linux style file paths, and to use something like Pathlib means you get cross compatible applications that anyone can use. We are humans working with humans to develop software for the benefit of humans. Not just humans with our preferred operating system, but all humans. If we ignore users outside of our native operating system, we are excluding an order of magnitude of people. Remember, users of just Microsoft Excel outnumber us 32 times. I want to change tracks for a moment here and adjust my microphone and address the second group of users, the educators. Not just people who teach children at school, but those that educate both academically and those that teach to empower people. Did you, you know that there are about 25 million software developers in the world? There are at least 70 million teachers worldwide. There are so many initiatives getting kids into coding that I can only scratch the surface in what time I have left. Teaching kids to code is arguably, arguably useful. Grok Learning is a Sydney-based platform that has taught thousands of students across Australia to program. Code clubs exist throughout the world, and there are coder dojos as well in Thailand, as we, well, I discovered yesterday in the lightning talks. Yay, lightning talks. But programming is arguably a useful skill, but it's more than that. Not every child is going to grow up to be a software developer, but it's highly likely that they'll be using technology in their daily lives. Getting kids interested in technology, sparking their creative interest, it's so much more important than teaching them just to code. And it's not just online programming courses doing this. Incentives like the BBC Microbit have been amazing for sparking interest in hardware for kids. The Python Software Foundation and other organisations formed a partnership with the BBC and got one million microbits into the hands of school children all around the UK. The source code for all this is open source which means anyone can contribute. The youngest contributor to date was 11. But it's not just British school children. CircuitPython is a fork of MicroPython, a version of Python so small and compact, you can fit it all into a tiny little microchip. And you can, just at PyCon last month, all attendees were given a CircuitPython Playground Express in their swag bags. And the amazing Nina Zakarenko gave a keynote demonstrating live how to program these kits. She gave a keynote with live hardware hacking in front of thousands of people on stage. She's amazing. And to hack on hardware, you're going to need to edit some code. And to edit some code, you're going to need a code editor. Mew is a Python code editor specifically created for beginner programmers. It's simple to use, but it's also got some pretty neat features. There's these nifty little buttons up the top here where if you press the button, you get a REPL. In, if you have your program and, for example, you print out things in your REPL, you can click another button and you can have those plotted for you if you happen to be printing out tuples. You can use this to do very interesting things, but just think about how hard it would be for you to be able to get your text editor to have an integrated REPL to then print out 
the output of a serial console into a live graphing um, application. Mu just does it all for you. And as a beginner, that is such an advantage. Because as a beginner, you do not know a lot. Serial consoles and terminals are such unfamiliar concepts, especially antiquated concepts. Most children have never seen a floppy disk, let alone know what it is. The joke is if a child sees one, they go, oh, you 3D printed the save icon. <laughs> These objects that were once fundamental to our use of computers are now so outdated that we can make these jokes. Why are we trying to teach these concepts as if they are new when it's just an embedded fallacy that confuses people? Reducing those barriers to entry is so important to ensure children aren't left behind. And it's not just in schools either. At PyCon and at regional PyCons UK and Australia, education tracks have been held for a number of years. This is where education practitioners can come together, learn and teach and share their experiences bringing Python to the younger generation. Indeed, at PyCon Australia last year, we had 10 kids under the age of 18 presenting their own work in short talks. They spoke about topics ranging from machine learning to neural networks to natural language processing, procedurally generated images, and so much more. We are running these, uh, this education summit again this year, so come along to Australia and see what the cool kids are doing, because they're literally kids and they're literally cool. The PSF has also recently closed applications for a grant specifically to help further Python in education. But it's not just the money and the teaching of the kids that's an active barrier here. The IT administration teams in schools work so hard to provide a network that allows students and children to use computers. Heck, a lot of schools are now using only tablets, not even desktop computers or laptops anymore. There is so much work that needs to go into keeping these systems up to date that deploying something like a local programming language to every machine is just, it seems unfeasible. Online systems like Grok Learning work around this because you just need a browser, you don't need Python locally, but systems like Mu need to be deployed somehow. And installing Python on every single machine is just asking for trouble because they don't call them script kitties for no reason. If you give kids a way to be able to interact with their laptops in ways where you could say, shut down remote laptops that are connected to the network that I totally did not do when I was a kid. No, sir, no. Um, my local IT administration team knew me well. But <clears throat> without system Python on these laptops, there's no distribution story. In order for someone to play around with Python to pip install something, you need to be able to install pip itself and you can't install pip unless you have Python. So without Python, you can't install anything. Thankfully, there are solutions for this. Mu solves this by using briefcase, which is part of the Beware suite, which we heard about earlier from Russell. Mu is able to create a distribution artifact on Mac OS with the help of, from briefcase. And for Windows environments, Mu uses Okay, I have never tried to pronounce this word out, front, um, out loud before. Um, PyInsist? Yeah, let's go with that. Um, it allows Python itself to be bundled up into the application into one executable package that system administrators and schools can then deploy on their fleet of machines. And by packaging Python within the application itself, students can only interact with Python from Mu itself, thus removing the ability for the student to do any damage to the local network. Ask me how I know. We are humans working with humans to develop software for the benefit of humans, not just big humans, but small humans as well. Getting the next generation interested in technology is just one part of it. And allowing non-Python developers, the school's IT administration team, to easily allow access to this type of technology is paramount. On to our next group of users, the creators. Not just the artists, but also the designers and the entertainers. There is so much art in Python, it's not funny. 
I could have filled my entire keynote with just this, but instead I'll focus on the best bits. Firstly, did you know that there's a charity auction every year specifically for Pythonistas? It's true. Celebrating its eighth year this year, the Pi Ladies Charity Auction is a fundraising initiative to raise money specifically for Pi Ladies, the international mentorship group that helps get more women become active participants in the Python community. And every year, wonderful items are donated, folks dress up, have a wonderful evening, bidding and drinking and laughing and winning some absolutely amazing items. Such as in 2015, where there was a 13 kilogram gummy snake that was auctioned off, child for scale. By all accounts, it tasted awful. There are also often major donations from Disney and other companies, such as this piece from um, 2017 of Moana artwork, or these custom decal guitars from 2018, 2019, respectively. But it's more than just these. There has been a huge search in handcrafted Python-related artwork in recent years. From beaded lanyards, laser-cut earrings, which I'm wearing now, cross stitches of Hello World and various interpretations of the Python logo, all these pieces have been highly sought after. I've even got a wonderful brass plated leather bound bracelet that I bid and won last month. I feel like Wonder Woman. <laughs> but it's not just art that looks like Python, it's art that looks like Python that's been made in Python. Such as my talk that I gave in Cleveland last year, of which the demo, the demo I was able to auction off for charity. This is a 40 centimeter by 40 centimeter Tasmanian oak framed tapestry of the PyCon 2019 logo, which I created from a chart that I made in a package that I wrote in Python. And of course, I can't stop talking about the Pi Ladies auction without showing you one last little bit. That is an oil painting of Guido Van Rossum. <laughs> the piece is called Benevolence. It was donated by Capital One and it ended up going for 9,001 US dollars. That's nearly 300,000 baht for those playing at home. This event last month raised over $41,000 in just one evening. It's the highest uh, Pi Ladies auction to date. So, back to creators using Python to make art. For the last two years, Linux Conf Australia have run mini conf's dedicated single day, one track events, specifically about art in tech. And one of those amazing projects was OctoKnit by Sarah Spencer. She hacked a domestic knitting machine from the 1980s to be a network printer using Raspberry Pi and a program she wrote, which is mostly in Python. She can then print as much as, as like you would a th with a 3D printer, but instead of plastic, she uses wool and yarn. And being a practitioner of hand tapestry, having an automation like this is amazing. This culminated in her magnum opus, Stargazing. All 88 constellations from both the northern and southern hemispheres weighing 15 kilograms of wool in 21 parts that had to be manually connected together because her knitting machine is only so big. I was able to see this in person. It feels really good. It's all wool. But it's not just physical art. There are multitudes of digital creators that are using Python to make entertainment, such as those using Pygame and the people that participate in Pi Week, which is a week-long programming challenge that attracts large crowds of contestants every time. Participants have a week to develop a game based on a theme and it must be written in Python. And some of the winners, they look really cool. This particular game, you can walk through portals and you're on a beach and it's all very cool and it's all written in Python. The next Pi Week is going to be in September, if that sort of thing interests you. But it's not just humans handcrafting items. Machines also get involved. 
Deep Dream, the computer vision API, inspired a bunch of artists that have created some beautiful pieces, like this one from Chris Roadley, which is flowers as dinosaurs. Some of the other Deep Dream images, the ones that look like dogs and eyes in the sky, aren't as pretty, but I like using this one as an example. The go-to example for how to use the Deep Dream API, it's all Python. And there are also services that you can use where you can take base images, such as the PyCon Thailand logo, and source example art, and turn it into pretty. But the barrier here is how can these creators share their artwork? How can, they can, how can they then allow people to take what they've created and remix it further? Glitch is a community where you can not only explore applications, but you can take your own copy and alter it. On the front page of Glitch right now, there is an example application which uses the publicly released data from the most recent Stack Overflow developer survey. And it lets you dive into the data and see what trends you can find. But if you read the announcement blog post, you'll see that there's a second application you can use. Dataset is a Python-based SQLite database explorer. With Dataset, you can just run a command that references a local SQLite database file and, ta-da, a dynamically generated website that lets you inspect and interact with the information in that database. And yes, this is running on Glitch. Glitch advertises itself as being highly JavaScript and no.js compliant, but you can get it to write Python too. As Simon Willison was able to demonstrate in his talk at PyCon, where he was able to share some of the visualization capacities of dataset, which he wrote, and its associated plugins, such as this particular map of transportation options around Ohio. Simon Willison was also one of the first people working on Django back in the day, and he has made some very interesting things in his journeys. But Simon describes that by using Glitch, it doesn't only allow others to see his work and interact with it, but they can take it and remix it and make it their own. This is an excellent way for people to start exploring, especially because you do not have to have anything installed locally. You can go on this website, click a button, and there's your entire developer environment. We are humans working with humans to develop software for the benefit of humans. Giving people a space to share and explore their art without having to bother about having to install anything locally means that you completely eliminate that barrier of entry. And finally, the explorers. And this time I literally mean explorers because we're going to talk about space stuff. Who here has seen the GitHub satellite keynote from last month? Good, I get to share it, all right. I mean, my stage isn't nearly as big as theirs, but you know. Who recognizes this image? <gasps> this is a black hole, for reals. It is not a computer generation, it is a picture. The Event Horizon Telescope was able to confirm theories about black holes by photographing an actual black hole. For scale, this is seven billion times bigger than our sun. Billion with a B, it big. And around the same time, you may have also seen this picture. This is Dr. Katie Bowman, who led the development of the algorithm for imaging black holes. And you see that code on her screen? It is created from the biggest virtual telescope in the history of humanity, is on GitHub, and it's all Python. Now, Dr. Bowman led the development of this algorithm. She wrote her doctoral thesis on it. She is literally a doctor based on this stuff. The entire project is absolutely fascinating. GitHub Satellite had a talk dedicated to a panel from the people who made this stuff happen. When the black hole image was released, there were nine contributors to this repository on GitHub. As of now, there's 14. But there are so many more people who contributed to this work than you realize. The CEO of GitHub, Nat Friedman, pointed this out in his keynote. On GitHub, if you go to any repository and you click on the dependency graph, you can see what packages, based on your requirements.txt or your setup.py file, what packages your repository depends on. And from there, you can work out what packages those 
packages depend on. And you can go all the way down and get a list of every single package that was used to picture the black hole. And you may notice some really familiar faces in here. We've got SciPy, we've got Pandas, we've got NumPy, Matplotlib, IPython, which I mentioned earlier. We also have staple Python uh, packages such as requests, URL, lib, Sphinx, Tox, Click, Ginger, Pillow, Beautiful Soup, Flask, Virtual Env. And it's not just packages, but people as well. You've got Brandon Rhodes, Brat Cannon, Ted Belchild, <laughs> Thea Flowers. There's a whole bunch of other people in there as well. But there is a lot of people that help to see the black hole for the first time. There are 21,000 people that directly contributed code to help us see a freaking black hole. <laughs> and a whole bunch of them are Python people. And while this number is really impressive, that's not the whole of it. Because this is just people who, con who contributed code directly to master on any of these packages. There are so many more people who contributed to this. GitHub specifically pointed out that there was only 21,000. It is at least 10 times more than that. Dr. Bowman was publicly ridiculed on social media because she did not contribute as much code to the project as people think she should have. But she was the lead. Since when does the person who leads your project commit the most code? I mean, technically the internet was right, She's only number four of the amount of lines of code, but since when do the lines of code matter? Since when does the line of code per developer matter in the hierarchy of a software project? Since when does code matter? There are so many more people involved in this project than what GitHub classifies as direct contributors. It's not just the developers on this project. It's also, for any project, the people who report the bugs the people who review the pull requests, the people who plan the projects, who participate in feature discussion, who keep the wiki documentation up to date. And that's just a subset of the roles that can be captured on GitHub. But it's so much more outside of that. Think of all the people who work on your projects, in your workplaces, in your communities, your manager, your peers, your UX designers, your testers, your, your technical writing team, your developer relations, your product managers, your legal team. And there's so much more than just the code. I've helped to try to bring this to light with a project that I made a number of years ago called Octo Hat Rack. Octo Hat Rack iterates through an entire GitHub repo and gets every single person that contributed to that repo, not just the people who are direct contributors who commit code to master, but anyone that is interacted on a GitHub repo. According to the GitHub Satellite Keynote, four people from the project contributed to that project. My application, I could find five. Seven people were invited and flown to Berlin to represent the project. Two of them don't have GitHub accounts. If people who don't have GitHub accounts participate and contributed to a project so much that they were flown to Europe to represent a project, then something is wrong. Projects need to take this into account by not just using an author's file, but using a contributor's file. Adding the people that may not have accounts on whatever social coding platform you have and ensuring that they are attributed and acknowledged and thanked is so, so important. It's not just the developers. We are a foundation that so many others build upon, but we are not the entire world. We need to develop for our users. We need to stop pitching our tools for developers, assuming that only developers will use our things. We need to have landing pages on our projects that describe not just the instructions on how to install what we're doing, but what our projects actually do. Heck, we need to have landing pages in the first place. I can't tell you how many times I have been told, oh, code is documentation. No, I'm a human. I don't read computer. I happen to be good at reading Python, but I still read in a human language. And we need to make sure that we communicate this to our users, assuming that they don't know what we know. We need to ensure that people can find our work, use our tools, and when possible, contribute back. 
We are humans working with humans to develop software for the benefit of humans. We are enabling scientific research. We are sparking the curiosity in children. We are the canvas for artists, and we are helping seeing further into the universe than ever before. Continuing to ensure that these tools and technologies are here for years to come and to be the building blocks, the foundations of our modern era, that is how Python can excel. Thank you for your time.